When we think about human evolution, we picture a steady march toward us. Bigger brains, better tools, more human faces emerging from the mist of time. But between 2.5 and 1.2 million years ago, something else walked the African savanna. Something that defies every assumption about what it means to be an early human-like creature. It stood upright on two legs like your ancestors did. It lived in social groups. It may have even made stone tools. But when you look at its skull, you're staring at something that seems impossible. A gorilla's head on a child's body. Molars the size of quarters. A bony ridge running down the skull like a helmet crest. This was Paranthropus, literally beside man, and for over a million years, four times longer than our species has existed, it thrived across Africa. In 1938, at a limestone quarry called Cromdry in South Africa, paleontologist Robert Broom pulled something from the rock that didn't fit. The skull fragment had human traits. The position of the foramen magnum showed this creature walked upright, but the face was wrong, too wide, too flat. The teeth were enormous. Broom had discovered the first Paranthropus robustus, though he wouldn't know the full implications for years. The name he gave it captures the fundamental strangeness, Paranthropus beside man, a parallel experiment running in the same laboratories of natural selection that produced us. While our ancestors were developing larger brains and complex tool use, Paranthropus went another direction. They became biological specialists, investing in jaw muscles and tooth enamel instead of neurons and culture. The fossils kept coming. Swartkrans Cave in South Africa yielded dozens of specimens. Then in 1959, Mary Leakey made a discovery at Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania that would become one of the most famous fossils ever found. Embedded in ancient lake sediments was a skull unlike anything from South Africa. The same massive build, but even more extreme. The media called it Nutcracker Man. Scientists called it Paranthropus boise. The first clear evidence that these creatures were widespread beyond South Africa. They were spread across the continent. Look at a Paranthropus skull in profile, and your brain struggles to process what you're seeing. The sagittal crest rises from the top of the skull like a mohawk made of bone. In males, this crest could extend several centimeters above the brain case. The crest served a structural purpose. It was an anchor point. The temporalis muscles that attached here were massive, extending down the sides of the skull and connecting to the lower jaw. In life, these muscles would have bulged visibly when the animal chewed. The zygomatic arches, the cheekbones, flared out dramatically from the face. It served a functional purpose, not aesthetics. These wide arches created tunnels for those enormous jaw muscles to pass through. The width gave their faces their characteristic dish shape. From the front, the face seems to spread horizontally, dominated by the cheeks rather than the forehead or chin. The teeth tell their own story. The molars and premolars were genuinely enormous, megadont, in technical terms. Some molars measure over two centimeters across. That's four times the surface area of your molars. The enamel on these teeth was thicker than any other hominins, built to last a lifetime of grinding. But here's what makes it strange. The front teeth, the incisors and canines were tiny, human-sized actually. This mouth lacked adaptations for tearing or cutting. It was built for crushing and grinding, with all the force concentrated on those back teeth. The skull itself was relatively small, with a brain volume between 410 and 530 cubic centimeters. For comparison, modern humans average about 1,350 cubic centimeters. But brain size wasn't the point. The skull was a framework for the chewing apparatus. The face was tall and flat, positioned almost vertically. The forehead barely existed, sloping back from heavy brow ridges. Paranthropus ethiopicus appeared first, around 2.5 million years ago in East Africa. The black skull from Kenya gives us our best look at this earliest form. The sagittal crest was already prominent, the face already dish-shaped, but compared to later species, Paranthropus ethiopicus was almost primitive. The face projected forward more. The brain was smaller, around 410 cubic centimeters. This was the prototype, the first draft of what would become an even more extreme design. From this ancestor, two lineages emerged. In East Africa, Paranthropus boise evolved around 2.3 million years ago. This was the most extreme version, the one that earned the Nutcracker Man nickname. Males stood about 4 feet 6 inches tall and weighed around 108 pounds. Females were considerably smaller, maybe 88 pounds. 
the sexual dimorphism was pronounced, with males showing more robust cranial features. Paranthropus boise ranged across Ethiopia, Kenya, and Tanzania, adapting to the savannas and lake margins of the eastern Rift Valley. Meanwhile, in South Africa, Paranthropus robustus appeared around 1.8 million years ago. Slightly smaller than their eastern cousins, males averaged 3 feet 9 inches and 119 pounds. They occupied a different ecological niche. The South African landscape was more varied, with limestone caves providing shelter and different vegetation patterns providing food. For decades after Mary Leakey's discovery, the nickname seemed to explain everything. Nutcracker Man. Those massive jaws and enormous teeth must have been for cracking hard objects. Seeds, nuts, bone even. The anatomy seemed purpose-built for it. The thick enamel could withstand the stress. The huge jaw muscles could generate the force. The story wrote itself. Then scientists started looking closer. Dental microware analysis examines microscopic scratches and pits on tooth surfaces. These marks form in the days before death, preserving a record of an individual's last meals. When researchers examined Paranthropus boise teeth under electron microscopes, they expected to find the deep pits and fractures that come from crushing hard objects. Instead, they found fine striations, smooth wear patterns, the kind you see in fruit eaters. This was highly unusual. It was unique in the entire hominoid radiation. This was puzzling enough, but stable isotope analysis made things more complex. Carbon isotopes in tooth enamel preserve a lifetime dietary signal. Plants use different photosynthetic pathways that create distinct carbon signatures. C3 plants include trees, shrubs, and herbs. C4 plants include tropical grasses and sedges. Most primates, including early hominins, show C3 signatures from eating fruits, leaves, and other forest foods. Paranthropus boise showed something unprecedented, a diet dominated by C4 resources. No other hominoid, living or extinct, shows this pattern. Chimpanzees don't eat grass, gorillas eat some bamboo, but their diet remains predominantly C3. Even baboons, who do eat some grass, don't approach the C4 levels seen in Paranthropus. The paradox deepens when you consider both lines of evidence together. The microware says they were eating soft foods, at least in their final days. The isotopes say they ate C4 plants throughout their lives. How do you reconcile this? The emerging hypothesis holds that those massive jaws supported foods required during shortages rather than preferred fare. They were for what they had to eat when preferred foods weren't available. The term is fallback foods. During good times, Paranthropus might have eaten fruits, insects, perhaps even some meat. But during dry seasons or droughts, when these foods disappeared, they could fall back on abundant but low-quality resources. Grass seeds, sedge stems, Underground storage organs like tubers, foods that required extensive processing to extract minimal nutrition. The massive jaws and teeth handled tasks beyond cracking a few nuts. They were for grinding through huge quantities of tough, fibrous vegetation. At Olduvai Gorge, Bed 1 preserves a remarkable moment in time. 1.8 million years ago, a lake margin in what's now Tanzania. In the same geological layer, sometimes just meters apart, lie fossils of Paranthropus boise and Homo habilis, not separated by thousands of years, not in different environments, the same place, the same time. Two kinds of bipedal apes with completely different survival strategies, walking the same shores. The evidence for coexistence goes beyond Olduvai. At Kubi Fora in Kenya, Paranthropus boise and Homo erectus fossils occur in the same deposits. At Swartkrans Cave in South Africa, Paranthropus robustus shared the space with Homo ergaster. Layer after layer, site after site, the pattern repeats. For over a million years, multiple hominin species occupied the same landscapes. Consider what this means. These were sustained overlaps, not brief or rare encounters. This was sustained coexistence across multiple species and vast timescales. When a young Paranthropus boise looked across the savanna, it might have seen groups of early homo hunting or scavenging. When Homo erectus gathered at a water source, Paranthropus boise might have been there too, processing sedges at the water's edge. The two lineages were pursuing radically different strategies. Early homo was developing what researchers call ecological opportunism. Larger brains allowed for behavioral flexibility. Tools let them process foods their bodies couldn't handle alone. They could hunt small game, scavenge from larger kills, crack bones for marrow, 
dig for tubers. When resources changed, they could change their behavior to match. Paranthropus had gone the opposite direction. They were biological specialists. Their solution to environmental challenges was physical, not cultural. Those massive jaws could process foods that Homo couldn't eat without tools. During droughts or seasonal shortages, when Homo had to search for new food sources or migrate to better areas, Paranthropus could stay put and switch to their fallback foods. The social dynamics would have been complex. Both lineages likely lived in groups. For Paranthropus, the pronounced sexual dimorphism suggests a polygynous mating system. Males were significantly larger than females, with more robust cranial features. In primates, this pattern typically correlates with male-male competition and single-male groups. Picture something like a gorilla troop structure, one dominant male, multiple females, and their offspring. Early Homo showed less sexual dimorphism, suggesting different social arrangements, perhaps more cooperative, with increased male investment in offspring. The two species might have avoided direct competition through different activity patterns. Homo focusing on hunting and scavenging during the day, Paranthropus spending hours processing plant foods in specific patches. Nyayanga, Kenya, 2.9 million years ago, on the shores of an ancient lake, something unprecedented was happening. Someone was butchering a hippo. The bones show clear cut marks, places where stone tools sliced through flesh. Percussion marks where hammer stones cracked bones for marrow. This is the oldest evidence of hominins processing large animals, predating previous examples by over 600,000 years. The tools themselves are unmistakable. Oldowan technology, simple but effective. Cores with flakes struck off to create sharp edges. Hammer stones for breaking bones. Over 300 artifacts scattered across the site. The activity was deliberate and systematic. This was systematic tool use and meat processing on a significant scale. Mixed among the tools and bones were two teeth, hominin teeth. And when researchers analyzed them, the teeth did not belong to early Homo. They were from Paranthropus. The oldest Paranthropus fossils ever found, in direct association with the oldest known stone tools. The implications are staggering. For decades, tool use has been considered the defining characteristic of our lineage. Homo habilis, the handyman, was named for this assumed ability. The narrative was clean. Paranthropus evolved massive jaws to process tough foods, while Homo evolved large brains to make tools. Biology versus culture. Specialization versus flexibility. But if Paranthropus was at Nyayanga, if those teeth represent the toolmakers, then the story falls apart. The researchers are careful with their language. They note that Paranthropus is the only hominin remains found in association with the tools. They're the only suspect at the scene of the crime, as one puts it. Without hand bones holding hammer stones, we can't prove definitively that Paranthropus made these tools. But the association is compelling. Consider the alternative explanations. Maybe early Homo made the tools, and the Paranthropus teeth are there by coincidence. But no Homo fossils have been found at Nyayanga, not a single tooth or bone fragment. Maybe Paranthropus was scavenging at a Homo tool site, but the teeth show no signs of carnivore damage. They weren't brought there by predators. The most parsimonious explanation is that Paranthropus made and used these tools. They were cutting meat from hippo carcasses. They were cracking bones for marrow. They were using technology to expand their diet beyond what their biology alone could process. This doesn't mean they were as technologically sophisticated as early Homo. The tools are simple, and we don't see evidence of Paranthropus tools at later sites. But it suggests that tool use emerged earlier and in more lineages than we thought. For 1.3 million years, Paranthropus was a fixture of the African landscape. Generation after generation, millennium after millennium, they persisted. Their fossils are common at many sites, sometimes outnumbering early Homo specimens. They weren't marginal or struggling. They were successful by any reasonable measure. Then, around 1.2 million years ago, they vanished. The extinction wasn't gradual. We don't see a slow decline in fossil numbers or a gradual reduction in range. The last Paranthropus boise fossils from East Africa date to about 1.2 million years ago. The last Paranthropus robustus fossils from South Africa are the same age. Despite their geographic separation and slightly different adaptations, both species disappeared simultaneously. Climate change is the prime suspect. The early Pleistocene was a time of intensifying environmental fluctuations. 
cold, arid periods alternated with warmer, wetter ones. But around 1.2 million years ago, the fluctuations became more extreme. Prolonged droughts became more common. The C4 grasslands that Paranthropus boisei depended on would have become less reliable. Even their fallback foods might have failed. But climate change alone doesn't explain the extinction. Other species survived these same changes. The real problem was competition. As the environment became more challenging, Paranthropus found itself squeezed from multiple directions. Consider their reproductive strategy. Like all apes, Paranthropus had a slow life history. Females probably didn't reach sexual maturity until their teens. Pregnancy lasted months. They likely produced one infant at a time, with years between births. Population growth was inherently slow. When environmental disasters struck, recovery took generations. Compare this to their competitors. Baboons, with their faster reproduction and more flexible diet, could bounce back from population crashes relatively quickly. Pigs, with their large litters and omnivorous habits, could explode in numbers when conditions improved. These species competed for many of the same resources as Paranthropus, but they could recover from setbacks much faster. Then there was Homo. By 1.2 million years ago, Homo erectus had spread across Africa and beyond. They had more sophisticated tools than the simple Oldowan implements. They had controlled fire at some sites. They were hunting medium-sized game. Their larger brains allowed them to innovate, to adapt culturally to changing conditions. When the environment shifted, Homo could shift their behavior. New tools for new foods. New strategies for new challenges. Paranthropus couldn't compete with this flexibility. Their biological specialization, so successful for so long, became a trap. Those massive jaws couldn't evolve fast enough to match rapid environmental changes. They couldn't suddenly develop new feeding strategies or migrate to radically different environments. They were locked into their ecological niche, and when that niche contracted, they had nowhere to go. The extinction pattern suggests a threshold effect. For over a million years, Paranthropus survived countless droughts and environmental shifts. Their fallback food strategy worked. But around 1.2 million years ago, something pushed them past their tolerance limits. Maybe the droughts lasted too long, even for their specialized anatomy. Maybe competition from Homo and other species intensified beyond what they could handle. Maybe it was a perfect storm, climate, competition, and their own biological constraints combining in exactly the wrong way. The last Paranthropus died without descendants. No transitional forms show them evolving into something else. No refuge populations survived in isolated areas. They simply ended. Three species, millions of individuals, over a million years of success, and then nothing. Not a trace after 1.2 million years ago. Their extinction marks a turning point in human evolution. After 1.2 million years ago, Homo stood alone as the only hominin lineage. The great experiment in parallel evolution was over. The biological specialist had lost to the cultural generalist. The massive jaws and megadont teeth, so perfectly adapted to their ecological niche, became fossils. The flexible brain and nimble behavior of Homo carried on. Looking at a Paranthropus skull now, knowing what we know, it's hard not to see it as a monument to evolution's creativity. Here was a solution to survival that worked for longer than our entire species has existed. A creature that walked upright like us, lived in social groups like us, possibly even used tools like us, but looked nothing like us. They were beside us, but never with us. Parallel, but never converging. The story of Paranthropus reminds us that evolution doesn't have a direction. It doesn't progress toward anything. It simply solves immediate problems with available materials. For over a million years, massive jaws and enormous teeth were a perfectly valid solution. The fact that this solution eventually failed doesn't diminish its success. Paranthropus thrived in environments that would have killed our ancestors. They survived catastrophes that wiped out other species. They carved out a niche so specific that when they vanished, nothing replaced them.